Okay, hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Yam Bar Podcast. My name is Brian Barcelo, host of this episode. Today's guest is an environmentalist, songwriter, musician, poet, author, writer, and journalist. His name is Steve Andrews, a.k.a. the Bard of Ely. Steve, thank you so much for agreeing to this podcast. Appreciate you. Well, thank you so much, Brian, for having me on your podcast. I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. And uh, I, can't, I can't wait to get, you know, talking about, you know, whatever, whatever comes up, whatever you're going to ask me. So you go for it. That's what's up. Let's cut to the chase. Got um, one super big question. Sure, it's on everybody's mind. Where did all the plastic go? But I figured you might need a running start to answer that. So another thing I'm curious about, they called you the Bard of Ely. Would you mind explaining what is the Bard of Ely? Yeah, yeah, sure. Like, um, a bard is, is basically a, a performer. Like in, in medieval times, they used to have minstrels, which were, which were bards. It's a poet, a singer-songwriter, a musician, a storyteller. These are all things a bard does. But what happened with me is I, I was living in a big estate in, uh, in Cardiff, which is where I come from originally, and it was called Ely. Also, Shaking Stevens came from Ely. I don't know if you know Shaking Stevens. He was a, um, a pop star, rock star. At one point, he had a few hits. But uh, anyway, um, not, not to talk about by Shaking Stevens, but talk about Ely. It was where I was living, and I was writing for a magazine for the homeless, which is called Big Issue. And I just so happened to have a copy of it here, so you can see. Yeah. yeah. The Big Issue magazine, mm -hmm. and I had a column in the Big Issue magazine. They knew that I was a musician, singer, songwriter, and poet that lived in Ely. So they used to call me the Bard of Ely. And you can see, like, I don't know if you can see that. Yes. Yeah. So, so they used to start my, my column with the Bard of Ely investigates or whatever I was talking about. And they called me the Bard of Ely. I liked the idea of being a bard from this, this housing estate. And, and it, it stayed. And that's how I became the Bard of Ely. <laughs> and um, what other writing had you did that um, would lead to the next question, which would be, where did all the plastic go? Because from, um, from doing the research, I understand that you wrote a poem initially and then um, changed that or turned that into a song. That, that's completely right, Brian. And uh, actually, with me, you know, when I write a song, I always write the lyrics first. And I, I think of myself as more of a writer than a musician, because for me, the word is what comes, you know, to me initially. I, I write my words down and then I put the tune to it later. And but sometimes the poem stays as a poem. This is actually what happened with uh, Where Does All the Plastic Go? For quite a few years, in fact, happened. Was an, it was a poem. But then I thought, what happened? What I thought was, uh, I need a song. And, and I was hoping that somebody else in, in the, the, the music world was going to be doing a song about plastic pollution. I was kind of counting on Neil Young. Neil's one of my heroes. And I thought, well, Neil has, has carried on doing his protest songs. Maybe Neil Young will do a song about plastic pollution. But he didn't. Mm -hmm. And I, I saw quite a few you know, big-name stars speaking out about plastic pollution. Kanye West spoke out about plastic pollution on Twitter. Chrissy Hind, Keris Matthews, Mick Jagger. So I thought this is all fantastic, but nobody's singing about it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my poem and convert it into a song, which is what I did. So that's how the song came about. Now, when you talk about um, plastics, and probably my fault, man, I should have opened up because a lot of people, I'm sure a lot of people do know about the plastic, but I think a lot of, um, perhaps a lot more don't know that there's actually a virtual island and i don't know how big the island of plastic is out there and um it's a really big problem if you don't mind explain to people about this patch of plastic uh, garbage everywhere and um why is such a problem i mean i don't think anybody should be um have to be told that it's such a problem when you look at it you can see that that's just not right and and another thing i saw i saw a turtle 
with a beer ring, you know, the plastic beer rings wrapped around the shell and it cinched the shell like um, like a girdle on someone's waist, you know, like a corset or something. But please, yeah, explain to us on this problem that we have with plastics and how it's messing up the environment, particularly the okay. ocean. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, there's actually like a few things there that, you know, I want to want to talk about this. That okay. Basically, you know, I think you're, you're talking about what is called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, oh, okay. which is estimated to be the size of Texas or, or even more so, you know, it's bigger wow. than Texas. OK, and that that is probably the best known of all of the what they call gyres. There are actually five of these gyres out in the ocean. So that's one. OK, and. Uh, people think of it as like an island. It's not an island you could walk on because all this stuff is floating. And unfortunately, most of it is, is small pieces of plastic because what with plastic, plastic was made to last and last it does. So when plastic breaks down, it doesn't decompose like everything else. It breaks into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. And if those are in the ocean, most of them end up floating about. So you've got this huge area, the size of Texas, with all this plastic floating about. You've got big plastic out there as well. You've got really big plastic. You've got tiny plastic. And it's just crazy. And part of my story and how I got involved in this was back in 2010, I was following the work of David de Rothschild. And David had a boat, which was called the Plastiki, and he was, he was sailing the Plastiki from San Francisco, okay, in America, over to Sydney. And one of the things he was trying to do was to call attention to how you can reuse plastic. He, he had a plastic boat, okay, made from 12,500 plastic bottles. Wow. And, and also other reusable plastic. So he was doing that, and he was going past the, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch to call specific attention to that. So I came into really getting involved in plastic pollution around that time. I was following David's voyage across the seas with that, and I started to find out about what I thought was a nightmare, was even more of a nightmare than what I thought. Because, there, as I just said, there were five of these massive amounts of, of floating plastic out in the oceans, and I also discovered this is going on like all the time. Every river in the world is channeling more and more plastic into the sea. And all around the world, people are, you know, are littering with plastic. And even when we, we, we do something, you know, which is right to put like plastic in a bin, but if it goes to a landfill, which is where an awful lot of, of the plastic goes, mm -hmm. it can still end up going to the ocean because if you get like a, a storm and you get like, you know, very strong winds, it can blow some of that plastic. And if there's a river nearby or if there's a drain or a stream, if the plastic goes in there, it makes its way down to the sea. And there's so much plastic going into the sea every day. And that's the problem. Um, the, the plastic we throw away, it doesn't, it doesn't disintegrate. It, it doesn't break down in, in a natural way. It becomes smaller and smaller. Most of the plastic is going in the sea. Mm -hmm. And when it's in the sea, you talk about turtles. Not only can animals like a turtle get caught up in plastic, and if, if it's a young turtle and it's growing, it ends up like crippled, like the turtle you're describing, because it's had to try and grow with a piece of plastic around it. And... Uh, a lot of other creatures, including seals, they get caught in plastic. They end up with plastic around their necks, or uh, sometimes you see seabirds with plastic around their head or caught in their beak or whatever. But the, even worse than that, a lot of sea animals, whales, fish, tur turtles, all these sea creatures are actually swallowing plastic. They mistake it for food and they eat plastic. And then they cannot digest it. And if it builds up in, in, their, in their gut, Eventually, their gut becomes full of plastic and they die because they, they lose their appetite. They don't want to eat any other food because their body is telling them you're already full. So, so that cuts out a natural thing in them. They cannot pass the plastic through them because the plastic's too big and it's stuck in, in their gut and it kills them. And the most sad thing of all with that is uh, um, like a, a parent seabird, like an albatross. And, and there were lots of photos. If you Google, you'll find these mm -hmm. pictures of albatross chicks with all the gut full of plastic, cigarette lighters and, uh, and bottle tops and all this other rubbish. Wow. And the poor, the poor parent bird has gone out in the ocean to search for food, which is what it should be doing. 
It cannot find any natural food, maybe because of the overfishing, which is another problem. Mm -hmm. See some floating plastic. It thinks, aha, great, there's some food there. It gets, it, it gets that bottle top or whatever. It takes it back and it feeds it to its chick, not knowing it's killing its chick. Right. And that's going on all the time. So the whole thing is so horrific. So that's why, you know, I had to do something about it. And it's like, I'm sure you've heard like Greta Thunberg and other environmentalists saying, mm -hmm. we need action. We need action now. I thought, okay, well, you know, what action can I do? I can write a song. And so that's why it became so important to me to get this song out there. Yeah, definitely to draw attention. Now, one thing, people think that it's um, a simple matter of just going around and collecting. I mean, it's a good start, you know, collecting the plastic. But I think, as you alluded to, about the microplastics in uh, the air. Now, that, I don't know how you're going to scoop that up. <laughs> it's just so tiny, you know, particulates and all of that. Do you have any ideas about that? Yeah, Brian, we can't, you know. I, I mean, the, the, the amount of microplastic and, and nanoplastic, which is even smaller than the, than the microplastic, yeah, we can't even see that most of the time. And in fact, you can go to a beach and what you see, what you think is sand, sometimes a lot of that sand is actually not sand. It's like little particles of plastic. Well, no way. Wow. This is how bad it is. And also like the, the nanoplastic can be in water and you, and you can't see it. So you could be drinking what you think is water and you are drinking water, mm -hmm. but you're also drinking nanoplastic. And, and as you say, if it's in the air, then it, it's like really fine dust and you can't see it. Now, we do know that um, microplastic nanoplastic has been found on the tops of mountains, like including Mount Everest. Yeah. And this this plastic is also found uh, in the Antarctic and the Arctic. OK, so you can say, well, how does it get there? It gets there in the air. And like if the, uh, what is happening again all around the world is. People don't realize this, the tire for a vehicle, a car or lorry or a van, yeah, th those tires used to be made of rubber, which is an organic material that it does break down. That's fine. But today, the, the, the tires for a vehicle are made of rubber and plastic. And so when you were driving a car on a road, there's wear and tear, and some of that wear and tear is tiny particles of plastic. What happens to that plastic? If there's wind, it blows it up into the air. If there's a rainstorm, it takes it down to the nearest drain and it ends up in the drain in the, in the, and ends up maybe in the river, it goes into the ocean. So we've got another huge source of microplastic is coming from all the cars and the vehicles on the planet on roads. That's one major horrible source of plastic. And we want to know how does the plastic get in the air? Well, that's one way it gets there. So wow. what I say to everybody, and I'm, I'm just going to say about David de Rothschild again, because David was talking about this back in, uh, in, in 2010. And I thought, OK, that, that is important. David was saying that we cannot get rid of plastic. So all the people saying we must stop plastic, we must ban plastic. All, we can't do that. Plastic is such a big part of our daily life now. Um, like, you know, this plastic here in front of me, this, this computer, this is made of plastic. This mm -hmm. plectrum I got to play guitar is made of plastic. My glasses are made of plastic. So much stuff is made of plastic. And even like in the health field, you know, if you go to the doctor, you know, there's, there's plastic stuff being used there. Um, if you go to the dentist, there's all this plastic being used. So throughout uh, the world, everywhere we're using plastic. Right. So we can't eliminate it. It's part of our life now. OK, but what we can do, and this is the most important thing, what David was saying, is we can reduce we can reduce the amount that's going into the environment. That's what's important. We can't stop it, but we can reduce it and we can try as best we can to get the plastic that's already there out of it and dispose of it, you know, in, in a good way. So this is happening again around the planet. Fantastic. People are doing beach cleanups, you know, people are going to the beach and they're collecting all the plastic they can find. That's wonderful. There are people out there on the ocean doing what they can to, 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 to bring the plastic in and, and they get rid of it. So there are people doing removal of plastic worldwide. That's wonderful. But we're never going to be able to remove all the plastic that's out there because there's so much. And in the oceans, we go to the oceans, right? The, there was plastic which sunk. 
You can go to the deepest part of the ocean, the deepest part where maybe people have never even been, and where there are like creatures which live down there that are being discovered still because people have never seen them, specialized forms of life that live in the depths of the oceans, right? The plastic, which is heavy, has gone. It goes down by the force of gravity through the water. Where does it end up? In the depths of the ocean. We're never going to get that stuff out, you know? And, and I think about also the, the weird specialized fish that live down there. They haven't got much food anyway. This is why a lot of them, you've probably seen pictures of like really weird looking fish, angler fish with luminous like lures and mm -hmm. fish with huge mouths and fish with huge guts so, that, so they can swallow something. They haven't got much food. So what they find is maybe some floating plastic. Oh, great, some food. They swallow it, you wow. know. So it's not the fish, just the fish at the top of the sea and the, the higher levels of the water. The fish down the bottom of the sea is swallowing plastic as well. And we can't do anything about it. We cannot do much about the plastic that's out there. We can try. We can all do our best in, 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 in removing plastic, you know. But we're never going to be able to do that. But what we can do is we can stop more plastic getting out into the environment if we can. We can reduce the amount of plastic. And David was talking about back in, in 2010, lots of people who are active trying to stop plastic pollution talk about this. We have like the four R's or even the five R's, which are reduce, refuse, yeah, recycle. Okay, uh, what's that? That's three of them. Um, re refuse, reduce, recycle, rethink. We can, we can rethink how we're going to be using the plastic. Okay, and so those are all things we could do, yeah, to try and, and stop, you know, this whole situation getting any worse. That, that's what's important. We've got to stop it getting any worse. And this, this is like something which is important with so many things in the world today, even like the COVID thing, you know, and I, I talked to a friend of mine who is a doctor, is a real doctor, and he's explained to me that the purpose of what they're doing is to reduce the amount of infection, to reduce the amount of, of, of terrible symptoms being suffered by people. He's, he's saying to me, yes, we cannot guarantee that the, the vaccination is going to work. Um, yes, people can still get infected, but what we can do is we can reduce. And this is what's so important with so many things, reduction. Yeah, And, and that's where, like, for me as an activist, I can say everybody can do something. And and we can all do something to reduce the problems in the world. Whatever we do, it's worth doing. And uh, that's, that's, I guess, what I, what I wanted to say about that. Excuse me. Yeah, it's, um, it's a huge problem. Like, I was sitting there thinking, the technology that we have that allows you and I, I guess we're on almost different sides of the planet, you know, the technology we have, it seems like a double-edged sword, you know, like a catch-22 type of thing. Like what you're saying with the plastic, we can't get rid of it. It's an integral part of our lives. And, you know, thinking about getting rid of it entirely, that's not really feasible right now. I understand that completely. And the reduction of plastic, getting it out of the water and all of that, um, yeah, some people may say that's not enough, but I think it's way better than not doing anything. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah, very much so. Uh -huh. uh, I think like, you know, doing anything that's going to uh, help the, the world, help, help the situation, help the people in the world, help the, the animals and the plants in the world, help the environment. Anything that we do is worth doing. You know, if it's making some improvement in the world, let's do it. Mm -hmm. And you know what? That can be on... Um, same thing, in a sense, could be said for the flip side of that. The, the world is so interconnected, you know, the, um, all the animals and the environment and all of that is so interconnected. The little things that we do can have a big effect negatively and positively. And then I was thinking about all of the adverse um, um, reactions that's um, going on with our plastic. It's not just affecting one aspect, it's a fact in all kinds of aspects, because if you kill off one animal or, um, you know, harm one animal, then whatever eats that or whatever it depends, you know, needs to survive with, then that animal will go too. Like one of the things I was reading about, because your book, the, um, the Bleaching of the Coral, and I realized um, 
Now that's a problem in itself because of the algae, you know, and the changing of the temperature, all of that's all related. Then I found out there's an animal called the, um, what is it, the crown of thorns. I don't know if you've ever heard of like, like a squid or something. And it attacks the coral. And the, the thing is in the millions. And like all of this is related. Some people will probably look at this and say, well, I'll see what this has to do with that. But people have to know it's a big circle and it's all connected and stuff. So anything we could do to help here, you know, to alleviate it and help in a whole bunch of other areas too. Yeah, that, that's completely right. And, uh, you know, it, it's part of what you know, the food chains, you know, what, what you, uh, I think we were talking about there. It's like, yeah one thing like it'll eat something else maybe it eats something that's bigger and uh, for example like you have and, and this is how bad the situation is that the plankton which are the really tiny creatures which live in the sea they're swallowing plastic so the plankton and you've got like really huge things you've even got like some whales okay which are plankton feeders and they take in vast vast amounts of water and they filter out of that water the tiny tiny plankton which is their food there are some big fish that, that eat, that eat uh, plankton. There are lots of animals that eat plankton, okay, in the sea. But the plastic has got into the, into the plankton. So any creature which is eating the plankton is also eating plastic. But you've got like tiny things, like a tiny fish or a tiny crustacean, tiny crab, something like that, okay, is maybe eating the even tinier plankton. But what it doesn't realize is it's eating the plankton, it's eating the plastic. Then something else comes along, like, you know, a slightly bigger fish to eat the tinier fish. And it's eating the tinier fish, but it's also eating the plastic in that fish. And so the whole thing, you know, it just sort of keeps going. And the one thing which is bigger is eating the smaller thing, and it's eating the plastic. And then the things right at the top, you've got like the whales, mm -hmm. and the whales are eating, the, the whales are eating plastic. And I'm sure like we often see like a news report of a beached whale somewhere, Mm -hmm. And they've done an autopsy on it to find out why it died. And they find that its gut was completely full of plastic, plastic bags, plastic rope, plastic netting. All this plastic is inside the whale. And, uh, and the whale is like right at the top. You know, the, mm -hmm. the whale is the, the biggest creature in the sea. And the whale is just having serious, serious problems because of the plastic. And it's all part of the food chain is going through that. And as I was saying as well with, with the seabirds, the seabirds are going to the sea to catch some, some fish or, you know, marine life to feed to the babies. And they don't find any, but they find plastic, they feed that. The plastic is a, is a, oh, a terrible problem in, in the food chains. Steve, <clears throat> how did we, excuse me, how did we get here? I mean, anybody with, I don't know, like half a brain, I guess, you know, you look at all of that pollution, all that garbage out there. And I think just about everybody would say that's bad. But how do we get to this part? You know, how do we get to this point? Uh, well, it, it hasn't taken that long, really, because, you know, I, I can go back to when I was a boy. You know, plastic was starting to be made then. So... Mm -hmm. And, and plastic was being hailed as a wonderful invention, which it is, yeah. because it doesn't break. You know, you, you can have some plastic and it's going to be here in 500 years or, or longer. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's built to last, right? And plastic is used in so many different ways of life. So it was a fantastic invention. Mm -hmm. It still is a fantastic invention. But what, what has gone wrong is that people didn't really realize that, you know, what what we're doing with plastic is going to have serious consequences in the world in, in the future and not even that much further in the future and so that is that is a big part of the problem you know people just haven't realized what was going to be happening with the plastic mm. you know and now and now that we do one thing i was reading um, some of your other material i want to get on go on a tangent on but i noticed that you're like super into nature um, you know, people being one with nature. And I can't help but to think that people who are into nature won't try to harm nature. And it seems to me that the further we get away from nature, it seems like the more things get all discombobulated and tore up and stuff. You know, so that's what I'm thinking. Like, um, it seems like we have to find a way to somehow get people more in tune with nature. Because like I was saying, people who love nature, I don't think they want to hurt it. They wouldn't do anything to harm it. So somehow, um, 
I don't know how to do it, but somehow we need to get back with nature. And I think that way we can understand how interdependent we are on it, you know, dependent we are. And we have to take care of what nurtures us. We have to help take care of it too. And I think um, bringing attention to this is probably one way we can start doing this. Uh, yeah, yeah, Brian, I, I completely agree with you. And I think, uh, well, I think for one, um, if you if you look at the indigenous people on, on the planet, all of these people, you know, um, understand nature, you know, uh, and maybe that maybe they live in a jungle somewhere, maybe they live, you know, it doesn't really matter where they live, but they depend on nature and they respect nature, okay, because it's their it's their food source, it may be it, it's used by in, in many other different ways. But they don't kind of go wholesale destroying it around themselves because they just don't do that and they respect it. But unfortunately, like um, the modern, the, you know, the modern world, the people in the civilized world, hmm. we don't look yeah, at it like quote that. Quote unquote civilized, yeah. <laughs> people from the civilized world have thought, well, we can just do what we want, basically. And if we want this, well, we take it, we use it, we do what we want, we like with it. And, and also the big problem is that the civilized world is sort of like the ocean. The ocean, oh, it's massive. We can throw what we like in there. That'll, it'll be able to cope. Mm -hmm. and, and the civilized world thinks, oh, the world is, is so big, we can take however much we like from it. We can't. Mm -hmm. The world is, is, you know, is of a certain size and the ocean is of a certain size and we cannot keep taking. So that's a big problem that's, that's gone wrong. And I, I just mentioned that because I really do think that indigenous people worldwide, they don't act like this. They respect nature. They understand exactly. that, you know. And so what's gone wrong is the civilized world has caused all this problem. The technological world has, called all, has caused all this problem. Yeah? yeah. So, you know, our scientists may be brilliant. They are. They are. I'm not saying that they're not. You know, they are. All this stuff. I mean, I can just see the stuff I've got in front of me. Somebody's invented this stuff. Somebody's put it together, all the stuff you've got there. The technology is incredible. And so we have all this stuff, but we are away from nature. Yeah? It's like... Um, people that are living in, in a tribal situation somewhere, they understand nature. Nature is maybe still all around them. Unfortunately, in some places, the nature isn't all around them because they've been kind of assimilated into the modern world and they don't have the things they need. Like once, you know, once upon a time in America, for example, the people there could go out and hunt. They could hunt buffalo or, or you know, that was their way. Mm -hmm. They cannot do that now. Mm -hmm. Now they have to go to shops from the, the civilized world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the civilized world has basically taken what people away from nature. And we have like, you can see this anywhere. You know, and, I mean, if you go to a city and unfortunately in cities, we're losing more and more trees in cities. We're losing the parks in cities. People are saying, oh, we need more buildings. We need to build another apartment block. We need to build another shopping center. This park, yes, it's great, but it's going to have to go because we need more building space. Mm -hmm. These trees here, well, yes, they're great, but they're going to have to go because of whatever reason. And this is going on all over the world. So every city is, is, is getting less and less nature. Yeah? And so people are becoming used to living with nothing to do with nature. And, and, and there's so many creatures and plants are disappearing anyway from the world, right? That people don't even see them. So they don't even know. They don't know, like younger people today maybe don't even know about some of the creatures that I'm used to and I've seen in my life. They don't, they've never seen them. They don't know what they are. Mm -hmm. I can tell you like in the UK, which is where I'm from, the hedgehog, okay, the hedgehog is now becoming really rare. The hedgehog used to be so common, you'd expect to see them in, in every garden. You'd expect they were like just an animal you'd see around. You don't now. So if it carries on like that and, and the hedgehog became extinct in the UK, you could say to, to a young person or a child, you know, hedgehog, and they say, well, what's that? They wouldn't even know what because they've never seen one. Mm. So this is another problem that we're actually losing so much of nature that we can't even, even talk about it because the, whoever we're talking to might know, not know what we're on about because it doesn't exist in their world. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're losing nature to a really alarming degree. 
And also something I, I sing about, you know, and if you, if you don't mind, I'll actually sing you my song about plastic pollution in a minute. Oh, I don't mind at all. Please do. Okay, great, Brian. Well, I'll do that. But I, 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 in my song, I say, plastic plants, what about real plants? I saw the fake ones at the store. And this is true. I can go to like a, I, I can go to like a big grocery store here, right? And in, in one of the aisles, there's going to be plastic plants for sale. Right. I've got some plastic plants in my apartment. Yeah, I resemble that remark, too. <laughs> oh, yeah, don't, don't, anyway, like, you know, I don't own this place. I, I've got a landlord. And right. when I moved in, there were some plastic plants mm -hmm. in, in, in the room, you know, which are part of the decoration. Yeah. Right. And so this has become normal as well. Instead of having real plants, mm -hmm. we have plastic plants. And it, it's all it's all like taking us away from nature. And that's the problem. And, and I think now for me also what you touched on really is that people who who know about nature and love nature are not going to want to destroy it. I'm lucky. Uh, I discovered nature when I was a little boy. I would have been about four or five and I fell in love with nature. I would go out in the garden. I'd find insects, creepy, crawly things. But for me, they were wonderful. Right. And I'm thinking, oh, look at this. This is beetle and, and, and all, all, all the things I found. And, and then I'd ask my mum and dad, I'd say, what's this? And they'd tell me, and maybe if they, they weren't sure, they'd say, well, we don't know, but we can, we can maybe find out in a book. So by the age of five, I was saying, oh, mum, dad, can you get me a book about butterflies? Or can you get me a book on wildflowers? If you can and, and they used to get me these books. And that, so that became something that I was fascinated by as a child. And I, and I just kept going. So for me, nature was something which was so wonderful, so incredible, so beautiful. And, but I also started to see that the nature was getting destroyed. And I thought, oh, this is so sad. This is awful. Because as a child, I thought all the flowers and all the bugs and all the birds and all the things, they were going to be here forever. You know, I, I, I thought, like, it's a childish way of thinking. You don't think about things being destroyed and dying and all. You, you don't think about that. So I thought, all this stuff, oh, it's so wonderful. It's going to be here forever. But I started to find, no, it's not. Like, I remember, like, my mum used to take me to a park in Cardiff, okay? This park, it had flowers. It also had a pond. And in the pond, there were newts, and there were tadpoles, and there were dragonflies. And for me, these were all amazing. But then one day we went to the park, and the pond had gone. Why had it gone? Because they'd filled it in and planted a flower bed there. And for me, this is really sad. I thought, no, no, the pond's gone. Where are the tadpoles and, and the newts? Where, where can they go? And the dragonflies, this is all awful. So, uh, so that was one of the first things I saw as a little boy about how uh, a wildlife habitat, which is what it is, yeah, and, and, and how part of nature can be destroyed by people, and very quickly. Yeah. And, and then, so as the years go by, I started to see more and more of nature being destroyed. And we've reached a point, you know, in the world where so much of nature is being destroyed. You know, the rainforests are being destroyed and uh, the oceans are being, are being destroyed with all the plastic going in and the overfishing, taking all the fish and the creatures which are there out. And all around the world, it, nature is being destroyed. Building developments are taking actual large spaces of wildlife habitat mm -hmm. uh, urban sprawl they call it it's sprawling away yeah. destroying nature roadways also you know yes. the, the parking lots and highways oh, and streets yeah, yeah. yeah i'm just thinking about like joni mitchell joni you know an amazing singer songwriter joni she mm. she wrote about all this in big yellow taxi you know mm. they paved paradise and put up a parking lot you know touching on what you were saying yeah mm -hmm. They, they pay paradise, nature, and they put up a parking lot. And the birds and the bees she talks about and, and the trees and all this stuff, you know, is what's happened. So that song, Big Yellow Taxi, it was prophetic. It, it, it was taking a look at what was going to be happening in the world and asking us to stop. You know, hey, farmer, farmer, put away the DDT now, is what she's saying, yeah? Mm -hmm. Pesticides, which right. are killing nature. So that, that song was amazing. And... Uh, you know, just unfortunately, you know, all this stuff has come about. Mm -hmm. You know, they have, they have paid paradise. Yeah. The, the farmers have continued using the pesticides. 
Mm -hmm. um, just ordinary people with a garden use pesticides. It's normal. Again, if I go to the store, I can buy a, a range of pesticides. Mm -hmm. and, and, and most people don't think about that. They think, oh, gosh, oh, there's, there's, a, there's an ant or there's a cockroach or, or there's a caterpillar on, on, my, on, the, on the plant. I'm going, oh, get some pesticides, spray it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's normal, right? Mm -hmm. So it's normal to use pesticides. But what isn't normal is that that particular pest that little bug, whatever it was, was the food of something. Yes. For example, like if you were a, a bird or some species of bird, you go to the garden to find a caterpillar to eat or to feed your baby bird with. I mean, there aren't any. Why aren't there any? Because somebody killed them with pesticides. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, or even like what can happen is you eat something which has been killed by pesticide and it poisons you, you, you know, whatever you are. Like if you're a bird, you, you can eat something that's been poisoned and you get poisoned. That's another part of the problem. So there's so many poisons being used in the world. Mm. And again, oh, it's a, a massive problem. Like, you know, people think, okay, we've got to kill rats and mice. How do we do that? We put rat killing poison down. Mm. Then something else finds the poisoned rat and it eats the poisoned rat, it gets poisoned. So many birds are doing this. Owls do this. Hawks do this. You know, all these big birds that are the, the raptors, what we call them, they are often eating poisoned, uh, poisoned dead animals they find. You know? Other animals do it. Like in America, you've got coyotes, right, and, and wolves. If they find a dead animal that's been poisoned, they don't know it's poisoned. They think, oh, food, great. They eat it. They get poisoned. So it's, it's a, a really big big, big problem all around the world. People are poisoning nature mm -hmm. and they don't necessarily even realize they're doing much harm, you know? Exactly. You know, even in um, my neck of the woods, um, I noticed um, not even reading, um, not really just being aware of things. I just noticed I don't see fireflies like when I was a kid, you know, they used to light up the area and stuff. I, I don't think I've seen any in years. Not saying they don't exist. I haven't seen any. And um, another thing, um, our ladybugs aren't the same anymore. I don't know what happened to our old ladybugs. They used to have, I think, um, four black dots on them. But now the ones we have, I think, have like eight dots or something on. I don't know what's going on. But I've just noticed changes and stuff here, too. Um, another thing, the, um, we're talking about animals uh, eating one another with poison, stuff like that. Um, the decline of certain species. You know, we were talking about the interdependence of these things and stuff, right? If all of this has to reach a breaking point. Any idea how far away that is or how far away it may be? Well, uh, th there's a term tipping point. And, and, tipping and point, there yes. are like mm -hmm. tipping points. And there are tipping points for so many things. And, it, it, you know, we don't really know, you know, whether we're past, past various tipping points or, you know, what the point, what that tipping point is, you know, have we reached it and what can be done? And like, because the scientists would say, well, maybe you can't do anything. You know, they were like, if you reach the tipping point and, and you go over it, then the results are, are absolutely dire, you know. And, and that's the worry with, with the, the whole of the climate crisis thing, you know. Like, how, how bad can it get? It can get very bad. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it's like um, the reason people like Greta Thunberg are, are like talking about this all the time and saying we've got to take action is because the world leaders as such and the big corporations are not taking the action that they need to. Why? So yeah. it's basically business as usual because what's happening is that they think, oh, we, well, we need to make more money. You know, this is what's important, making money. And, and, it comes under what I said earlier about the modern civilization has thought we can take as much as we like, we can do what we like. So making money is, a, is of prime importance. Yeah, Governments are, are thinking about making money. Corporations think about making money. Every, in fact, most people think about making, it's normal to think about yeah. making money. And in again, the world we created. Yeah, yeah. The indigenous people don't think about making money because they never had money. Right. They don't understand money. Money is something that's been pushed onto indigenous people by the modern civilization. And it used to be, and I'm actually thinking about, there's a documentary about these people. These people are amazing. These people are called the Jarawa. They live in the Andaman Islands uh, in, 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 um, in Asia. And they live in a jungle. They, they have been there for thousands and thousands of years. They get everything they need from the jungle. 
They also get some stuff out of the sea. They catch fish in the sea, right? They've said they don't want anything from the modern world, the outside world. They've said the outside world is bad. We don't need it. We don't want it. We are happy with what we have here in our home. Now, if they didn't have any kind of incursion from the modern world, the civilized world, they could carry on for thousands and thousands more years, and, and they'd be completely content. In their jungle home, they get their food from the jungle home, they get fruit, and they, um, also they do a bit of hunting, that they were killing pigs there, okay? But they've had, like the modern world has come in on them, the modern world has built a big road right through the forest. That's a problem. Mm. That road has brought in tourists who want to see these strange people living in a jungle. Mm. So they have that. They have poachers which have gone there. Okay. Poachers have got guns. So, you know, they're not like, you know, hunting like, like the Jarawa do. Mm -hmm. They hunt with guns. So if they see a pig, they shoot the, they shoot the pig, it's gone. So the Jarawa are actually even losing the animals that they hunt. So they can't, you know, so they can't even hunt as well as they used to. And they're getting on the beach, they're getting plastic is, is, is washing up on the beach. So they got all this stuff coming in from the civilized world and they say, we don't want it. We're happy with what we've got here. And they are like a prime example, if you, if you Google them, the Jarawa. Yeah? I'm familiar, I think those are the guys that are shooting arrows at airplanes when they go by. <laughs> now they see planes, it's okay. Yeah, well, it's like, <laughs> that's right, yeah. So, so it's like, what I'm trying to say is that mm -hmm. the money you know, as, as being the goal of life and what, what is most important, what we all need. That, that is not needed by people living in an indigenous way. So it, it's, it, it goes along with modern life, with civilization. And because money is so important to governments, world leaders, uh, corporations, yeah, they are not doing what needs to be done to stop us going over tipping points. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it's, it's very worrying. Some, something I, I do talk about in my book is I talk about the Kogi people. And again, unfortunately, most people don't know anything about the Kogi people. The Kogi people live in, um, in, in, in Colombia, uh, in, uh, in, in South America, and, and a mountain chain called the Santa, uh, the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and these people, the BBC TV uh, made a documentary about them. And that was in, what was that, 19, 1990, I think mm -hmm. that was, yeah, you're 19. And they gave a warning. The, the documentary is called, and again, if, if people want to Google it, they find it. Um, uh, from the heart of the world, the Elder Brothers Warning, okay? And, and these people, indigenous people that live on a mountain, mountains in Sierra Nevada, Santa Marta, mm -hmm. they could see that the ecosystem, the, the natural world, was not as it should be at all. Now, these people uh, had survived the Spanish invasion, whenever that was. You know, the, mm -hmm. the Spaniards came over there, they had guns, they had the Catholic religion, they had, and, and, and they attacked these people who were living peacefully there. These people, the Kogi, they went up the mountains out of the way and they survived. And so that they haven't wanted anything to do with the civilized. They can see the civilized people down on the coast. They can see the cities and all that going on. They didn't want anything to do with us. But they, but they saw that there was so much wrong with nature that they decided they wanted to speak out to the world. Okay. So this is why the documentary was made. Mm -hmm. And the, the thing which was for them was the tipping point, why they really thought, well, it's gone too far. We've got to warn the world was up on the top of the mountain, yeah, there should be snow there. Mm. The snow had gone. And the Kogi say they have stolen the clouds, they being us, the civilized world. We've taken the clouds. The snow is gone. They say, and they're right, if there's no snow on the mountain top, there's going to be no water because there's going to be no snow that's melting to make the stream, to make the river, to, to, to basically feed with water all the forests down below and eventually to get into the sea. And if you take away all the water, everything dies. One of the, on, that, on that particular documentary, one of the Kogi men, he says, uh, the younger brother, by the way, they call of us the younger, they say the younger brother, he thinks that we can plant more trees. But I think if there's no water for those trees, they die. Or am I wrong? 
And, and, and that is, that's a problem. And this is actually going on anyway. There's all around the world. People are saying, oh, this is a serious problem we got here now. What we need to do is plant more trees. And, and they are planting more trees, but if there's no water, the trees die. Right. You know? So uh, again, what I'm, I'm saying, I, I mentioned that because these are indigenous people and they gave a warning. Indigenous people know how the world should be and they can see what the rest of us are doing. This is wrong, you know? Exactly. And, and, and these people, they gave a warning. The warning was not heeded. In fact, even though it went out on BBC, obviously not enough people saw it. Or even if they did see it, they thought, oh, yeah, well, there's some people up on, up on a mountain in South America. What has that got to do with me? That's another part of the problem. People think, well, yeah, but that's over there, or that's over there. What has it got to do with me? That's the problem. Everything has got to do with everybody else everywhere because all of this is connected. We're only like, we all share this planet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so what somebody does in one part of the planet can affect this in another part of the planet. Exactly. Yeah. You know, think about the butterfly effect. I don't know how true that is. Butterfly over here causes a, anyway. Now, yeah. um, the corporations, we mentioned the corporations and they're handed this. What about education? Because what I'm thinking of right here in Albany, where I grew up, around the corner here, there's um, a row of maple trees. And just relatively recently, within the last couple of years, they've been hooking up buckets with tubes into the maple trees, you know, to extract, you know, the um, maple, maple yeah. Shore. Now, yeah. here's the crazy thing. I've been walking up there. I'm almost 60. I've been walking up there my whole life. Never knew there were maple trees, per se. Never knew that I can get sap out of it to make syrup. Matter of fact, probably passed that tree on my way to the store to buy syrup. You see what I'm saying? But when I was in school, they taught me calligraphy, which I've never used. They taught me Roman numerals. I never used them. And they taught me about some guy named Taft. And at the time, I didn't care. Learned about him later in Boss Tweed and all those guys, politicians. But they taught me a lot of things, but they never really taught me about nature, never taught me about the things around, never taught me about how aspirin comes from trees. You know, things of this nature. No, taught me about the scallions that's growing at my feet. And I uh, discovered them just from mowing. I said, wow, it smells like onions, you know, and realized that, you know, I have food down there. What I'm saying, what about the education system? Uh, what part does it have the role? Parents also. You know. uh, Brian, again, you know, you've touched on something there. Again, it's so important. Um, I, I know, like, when I used to go to school, um, you know, uh, teachers did talk about nature. You even had, like, maybe, like, nature study and uh and, and this was like part of the education system. I think a lot of children go to school now. They don't have nature study now, you know. So people are not being educated about nature. And uh, people, are, people are thinking in terms of like, especially with like processed food, packaged food. They don't think of like where that food originates from. They don't think like how you know, where it came from originally. They think, oh, it comes from the store. We go to the store, we buy it, mm -hmm. you know. And, and so the whole uh, the process of, of learning about how how a food comes about is missing. Mm -hmm. And uh, certainly, like, I, I think, like anybody who, you know, um, an animal rights person or, or somebody who wanted to talk about veganism or vegetarianism can say there's a part of the missing ingredient there is that people don't know about how the animals that becomes the meat that they can buy or the fish or the dairy produce how that really came about. If they did know about how, how it came about, they might think again and like, oh God, that's terrible. You know, yeah, so yeah. there's a missing part of it all. Like mm -hmm. people don't see what goes on in the slaughterhouse is the easiest way of, of explaining that. You know, and, and even with fish, people don't see like how the fish are caught and how they die on, on the deck of the fish and, or, or the, you know, the, the fishing boat or the, the trawler or whatever. You know, a lot of that is, is terrible. So people just think, oh, we go to the shop, we buy it. We go to the restaurant, we order the meal, you know. So there's a missing part, is a missing, and it's education. People don't know. And that's the problem with so many things in the world today. People don't know. So, you know, it's not their fault. And, and you can't say that, you know, it, it's people, people are to blame because if they don't know something, how are they to blame? And so... The remedy for that is, is education. They need to have things explained. They need education. And we need better education. And we need more education around the world, you know. Exactly. Education is most important. 
Mm-hmm. Let's and, see, uh, I know, um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you uh, off. I was just going to mention a song, and it would get too far yeah, away yeah, from yeah. your song. But I mean, I didn't want to stop your thought. <laughs> you had something else to say? Not at all. Not at all. Not, uh, it's a, something like, I, I tend to just go off on, on ranting about whatever I'm talking <laughs> And, and I forget, but, but no, no, I, I want to, and, and actually talking about education, mm-hmm. I am educated even if I'm doing this song because the song is explaining about what's going on. So I'll do you the song now. All right. Plastic plants, what about real plants? The sort of fake ones at the store. People must want them, people must buy them. I don't want to see any more. Where does all the plastic go? Into the sea, into the sea. How does it get there? Who threw it away? Was it you? Was it me? It's not hunting, it'll kill the last whale. Plastic will do it, it's a very sad tale. And all the albatrosses are dying out too. We keep on fishing in the oceans. Plastic stew. Where does all the plastic go? Into the sea, into the sea. How does it get there? Who threw it away? Was it you? Was it me? The plastic bag I bought, it very quickly broke. And if it ever gets burned, there'll be poisonous smoke. Where does all the plastic go? Into the sea, into the sea. How does it get there? Who threw it away? Was it you? Was it me? Plastic kills the turtles and it's eaten by the fish. Plastic's in the food chain and the dinner on your dish. Where does all the plastic go? Into the sea, into the sea. How does it get there? Who threw it away? Was it you? Was it me? Was it you? Was it me? Was it you? Was it me? Ooh, right. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. Ooh, that's a sob. And you wrote all of that, (laughs) man. Yeah, yeah, and, and and that song is is where like my whole uh, Ocean Aid project kind of started because it, I've got this idea for Ocean Aid. Shall I tell everybody about Ocean Aid? Yeah, matter of fact, I was hoping you did. I had like a rough outline of things here, and it's definitely on it. So please do tell okay, us about Ocean great. Aid. Mm-hmm. So anyway, like what happened was I got this song out. I recorded this song, by the way, and I just want to say this that. It was produced by Jace Lewis in his, his studios, North Stone Studios in Wales. And so I got that, that song and things started to happen. Like I had uh, this book came about, you know, Filippo Solibello in Italy, like he contacted me. Stop Plastica. And, what is that? Stop Plastica. Stop Plastica Amare. Amare is the sea. Stop Plastic to the sea. Mm-hmm. And, and there's a whole chapter in here, again, called Where Does All the Plastic Go? And that, that came about, and that so many things have been coming about worldwide, right? So I, I, that was Italy. In, in, in Portugal, I was on the front page of the Portugal News with a little caption. It says, Singing Against Pollution, Steve Andrews. Recently, I had this in, again in the Portugal News. Yeah, okay, this is about my book. see with a butterfly in your beard there in that picture. Me with a butterfly. I'll, I'll get to that. I'll explain about butterflies a bit later, if you'd like. Uh-huh. And I have like this. This is in Ocean Aid. Okay, this is in... Yeah, what publication is that? This is Sund Magazine. Okay, this is from Wales. Ah. So, so, I, I, so, this, so we're talking about there, like... Uh, Italy, Portugal, Wales, but also Australia, all right? So what happened, I've got here, and I'm, I'm a Rotarian now, you can see this, right? What happened was the other year, somebody from the Rotary Club of, 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 Windham, of Windham Harbour in Australia, they found me on Instagram, mm-hmm. and they said, Steve, you know, we're really interested in, in your song about plastic, and, and maybe we could feature you in the Wave magazine. 
So I said, yes, please, thank you, you know. So I was in this Rotary Club magazine in Australia. And then I, I was invited to come to their online meetings. And so I'm finding out more about Rotary, which I didn't really know much about. I knew it existed, but that was about it. I'm finding that the people were very open to what I had to say. They made me a guest speaker, uh, you know, to their club, talking about all this stuff I'm talking to you about. Mm -hmm. And I found out there were a tremendous number of environmental activists in Rotary. And so I joined ESRAG, E-S-R-A-G, which is the environmental department for Rotary. There are people, I, I go to presentations online now, there are people doing fantastic work, cleaning up rivers, cleaning up the oceans, trying to save the, the, the forests. All this stuff is all being handled by, by Rotarians. So for me, it was like um, a door that had opened to me about a world of, of people who I feel like, like my kind of people, I feel fantastic, you know. So, so I joined Rotary, so that's why I got into that. And it was in Australia, like even though I'm in Portugal, people think, well, that's a bit weird. Why don't you join a Rotary club where you are, Steve? Why are you joining one in Australia? And my answer, you just heard, is because they found me in Australia. And I thought about it, and I thought, well, this whole problem of the oceans, you know, the whole problem of the plastic is worldwide. So, you know, we share the ocean, we share the world. It's, it's not to do with, are you, are you from one part of the world or another part? It's like, this is our problem worldwide. So the more countries that contact me, the better. And so like Ocean Aid was, a, was an idea that I came up with when I, when I put my song together. I thought, you know, years ago, we had like this live aid concert, massive concert, you know, really big bands like Queen played live aid. And, I think David Bowie was in, in Live Aid, and, and he was massive, and it was in a stadium somewhere. And I thought, well, I, today, if we could have, like, Ocean Aid, mm -hmm. we could have, again, a stadium. We could have, maybe we could even have some of the, the acts I mentioned, like, you know, people like Mick Jagger. If we could have the, the Rolling Stones playing Ocean Aid. If we could have, uh, who else? Uh, yeah, Brian May from, uh, uh, Brian has spoken out about. Steve Plastic. Andrews. Uh, uh, um, Steve Andrews, yeah, really, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Steve Andrews on that yes. stage doing. Where does all the plastic go, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and so it, you know, it is possible. Um, so I started talking about Ocean Aid as a, it's a project. When, when I, I've realized, like in certainly in the last two years, since we've had all these lockdowns and stuff, that maybe, maybe you know. It doesn't have to be like a massive stadium-sized concert to start with. Maybe, and the maybe is important, maybe, maybe people can do smaller ocean aids all around, all around the planet. So what I'm really trying to do now is I'm trying to leading up to the big stadium-sized concert, okay, one day. But in the meantime, if people want to do their own ocean aid concerts, wherever they are, I say go for it. This is what we need. Because the... The purpose of Ocean Aid concert is to raise awareness about all the problems, okay, which the oceans are experiencing, and also to raise funds. You know, I've got no, I'm, I'm talking about money, but like it's fine to, to raise funds for charitable organizations doing something about the oceans. I, I've chosen Sea Shepherd, and I'm really, really proud to say, like my book here, Captain Paul Watson of Sea Shepherd has endorsed my book. I don't think I get a shot endorsement, okay? And uh, I, I decided, like, that was charity I'd like to support. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you, can su you could support any charity you really wanted to mm -hmm. that was doing something about the oceans. Greenpeace is another one. You know, there were lots of people out yeah. there. Doing and I just thought, like, if I can inspire people to put together Ocean Aid concerts, that's worth doing, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm, I'm trying, to, trying to do. But also because of the lockdown, it was end of March 2020, I was introduced to Rue Starr, who's a lady you might know from New York. Mm -hmm. and, and there was like there was a guy called James Lane. James, James Lane and, and Rue were, were hosting a show called the, the Rue and Who Show. So uh, I became a regular, like a guest and regular performer on the Rue and Who Show. And I met a lot of other musicians from New York. I've now got loads of friends in New York. And if I ever get to New York, I can meet these people. We could do gigs together. We could record together, whatever, you know, and I'd love to do that. 
But because of the, the lockdowns and the whole problems with that, there were an increasing number of people were, were doing gigs online, were doing like live streaming events. And, and I became part of that community in the Ruin Who show. And one of the guys in this guy called Joel Landy, and he's a singer songwriter from New York. And Joel said to me, he said, Steve, there's a, a show called the Ecologic Show on the WBAIFM. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and maybe you could come on there. And I said, yeah, I'd love to. So, so that actually happened. And I was a guest on the show. I played my song on the show. And, and, and so I added that to the countries around the world. So I could say also now America, New York. Yeah, I've been talking about plastic pollution and, and my ocean aid idea. So the countries are, are, are gradually, in a way, coming to me. Like, I, I'm not even having to go out to find them. They come right. to me, you know. And, and so I think of myself, as, if you like, as kind of the originator, the originator in the music world of getting something done about plastic pollution, drawing attention to it, raising awareness, yeah. And hopefully one day we have a stadium-sized, stadium-sized, right, Ocean Aid concert with really big name acts. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I really think, I, I'm really confident that a lot of the big name acts, if they knew about that mm -hmm. and, the, and the idea was put to them, they'd say, yeah, yeah, put me down for that. Put the band down for it. That's great, you know, mm -hmm. because a lot of the acts, in fact, I've only recently found this out, okay, Coldplay, okay, a massive, massive name in, in mm -hmm. the rock music world. Coldplay support Sea Shepherd. So they're already, you know, uh, they're already into, into, you know, what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. They support the same guy as I support. They support Captain Paul Watson. And so, like, if it could be put to Chris Martin and Coldplay, you know, would you like to play the Ocean Aid concert with funds going to Sea Shepherd? I think they'd be quite likely to oh, yeah. say yes, yeah. you know. And I, and I think, like as I said, like Brian May, Brian May has spoken about plastic pollution. Brian May, with Queen, played Live Aid. If he said, Brian, you know, would you be interested? I'm sure he'd say yes, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe when I say I'm sure, I can't speak for these people, but, you know, you get what I'm saying. And I know also like Mick Jagger from the Rolling Stones. Mick has spoken out about plastic pollution. Mick, Mick uh, tweeted about it on his Twitter account, talking about like pledging to eliminate an item of plastic from your life. And I thought yeah. that's great. I and I found that. out. I think Sorry. people are going to hear your message. And I think um, the people that um, you mentioned, I think were to get to them. Well, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. And like, I, I, as I said, like, I'm an originator. I'm, I'm somebody that, that's speaking out as much as I can, you know. Mm -hmm. But I also realize, like, because I don't have the kind of celebrity clout that some of these massive names have, mm -hmm. but I can't. I can't get that publicity. In fact, you're helping me right now, Brian. So thank you. Any publicity I can get to get this message out is so, so worthwhile. Is so, and I'm so grateful for that. So I, I, I want to thank you right now in at this point in time for having me on your podcast talking about all this stuff. And I've just, I've just tried to, I've just explained it, you know, what it's about. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> You know, um, I'm going to say it, you're um, in a sense preaching to the choir, because I don't know, but I have several posts throughout the years about plastic, environment, somewhat of an activist myself. And that's when I saw what you're doing. It resonated with me. You know, kindred spirits, you know, kindred spirits in a sense, you know, at least as far as that goes. So, yeah, I I'm all for that. And anything I could do to help that. I mean, tremendous. Matter of fact, I'm going to get some of your products, too. That could help in some small that, um, way that way, too. Um, now, um, I know we're getting down to it. We're going to constrain this to about 45 minutes. And you have um, such a resume here. <laughs> we can talk forever. <laughs> now, what I wanted to make sure is that we get the links. Of course, you know, they'll be in the description and everything. Um, I'm going to make sure we get the links out there where your books can be found, um, your website. And then also anything that we may not have touched on that you want to make sure that we cover and stuff. So take it away. <laughs> well, I just, I mean, you know, what we have, stuff that we haven't touched on, the, 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 there is so much, you know, uh, uh, really, that there's so much on. Mm -hmm. And and then another uh, thing too, yeah, your, um, your websites remind people where they can purchase your books, check out your music and any other um, thing you may have. Yeah, I, I think, mm -hmm. I think actually, like, 
you can see it there, like steveandrews.info. I, I stuck this on my guitar thinking this is a good way of getting that, nice. <laughs> that message over. That, that's one that, that's my, if you like, my landing page. Yeah. Yes, yeah. You know, you can find out a lot about me there and you can also find out how to contact me there. And, 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 and this also, my landing page takes you to my Bard of Ely page. Yes. Yeah, I like the way they did that. That's good. Explain about that. So yeah, and if you guys um for you guys who um who are listening, Steve on um Steve has on his guitar. What was that? Steve, um, steveangels.info, right? And that's where people can go to um find the rest of your work. And that's a simple way to do it, you guys. Now, um, like I said, we're getting down to it. Do um you have um words of wisdom? Final words, final thoughts, you know, for people out here, something that you just and like some kind of impression you want to leave upon them besides the great impression you already left. Anything you'd like to leave people with? I'd like to leave everybody with a song. I'd like to go out with a song. Hey. And, 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 and the song is, is about like real incidents that happened in my life. So it's based on some truths. And, and it's also a song that's, you know, it, it's about, well, it's about butterflies, you know, it's about butterflies and butterflies, something very important to me, you know, I, I, I rear butterflies, I rear monarch butterflies and swallowtail butterflies. And, and I, I've been looking after insects since I was a little boy, you know, and I, I told you like when I was a little boy, I discovered nature. One of the things I discovered as a little boy were caterpillars. And I was fascinated. Right. I thought, look at this. It's a it's a long green thing or it's a long furry thing or it's a, you know, all the different caterpillars. Mm -hmm. And then I find out that the caterpillar, it turns into a chrysalis. Yeah. And or a cocoon, it spins a cocoon. And then a butterfly or a moth, an amazing transformation takes place. And like that as a child, this was like incredible. You know, it's like magic almost. Yeah. And so I started to look after these creatures. <laughs> I've kept on doing it all through my life. So I really have like looked after butterflies and, and, and moths. I do that as well. And, and, and uh, what's happened is I wrote this song called Butterfly in My Beard. And I really have had butterflies in my beard. I've got a butterfly. This isn't a real butterfly, but there's a girl, <laughs> Portugal, Sarah. She made me this butterfly. And she calls me the butterfly man, right? There's the butterfly. This is a monarch <laughs> butterfly. And I'd like to do this song, Butterfly in My Beard. And in the song as well, going through my pile of stuff, I've got, in the second verse, I sing, they call me the bug man in the news one time. And you can see there. Wow. He's showing a, showing a, a gigantic roach. Is that a roach that you have on your glasses there? It, it is indeed. It's a, it's a gigantic Madagascan hissing cockroach. And in my lyrics, I say, a hissing cockroach on my head got plenty of views and and that's where it did and and the photographer the reporter guy that came out to my house he said oh steve yeah now if you can put one of those cockroaches on your head then oh yeah that's great and then he took the picture but what <laughs> so it actually nice. says in in the stories it says catch the bug special world of insects for steve Bugman steve andrews loves coming eye to eye with the insect world so that's where that particular verse in the song came from. But before I sing the song, I just want to explain this, right? That in the last verse, I say, make a butterfly and fly with me, say yeah. And this is how you make a butterfly. You put your hands together like this, and you flap your, flap your hand like that. You've got it, Brian. <laughs> I got it, okay. A butterfly, and you've got your two thumbs there, which uh -huh. make the antennae, the antennae of the butterfly. <laughs> And then I, and I sing, make a butterfly and fly with me. <laughs> say yeah. And it's easy to say, it's easy to say yeah. yeah. Make a butterfly and fly with me. Say yeah. So we're going to get to that verse in a bit. And I'm going to play the song now. And <laughs> okay. just, I just want to say it's been absolutely lovely being on your podcast. Thank you again for inviting me. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you. Everybody watching, if you'd all like to make butterflies with me and say yeah, please do. Let's do it. I had a butterfly in my beard, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> I had a butterfly in my beard, oh yeah. I had a butterfly in my beard, it looked pretty strange. I had a butterfly in my field. 
everybody out there everybody i know time flies by when you're having fun and stuff once again we thank you guys for joining us here on the yambar podcast um steve andrews barter ely <laughs> eli <laughs> ely thank you so much i loved your song loved everything you talk about i love what you're about what you're trying to do for this world oh man everybody please go out there check out steve's work help him out any way you can Oh, yeah. And also to remind you guys to be sure to check out our previous Yambar podcast guests. Um, once again, my name is Brian Barcelo, here with Steve Andrews, Bard of um, Ely. And my name is Brian Barcelo, host of this episode. And remember, people, the Yambar podcast is a place where you make it happen. Once again, Brian Barcelo, along here with Steve Andrews. Peace, everybody. All right. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Thank you.